Hey guys, for those of you who are looking to pay a visit to the uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., you may have been disappointed to discover that the museum on the mall is closed and may have just given up on the whole thing. If so, you are making a big mistake. There is another museum, as you can see here, that we're going to be paying a visit to. We're going to be checking all of this stuff out in detail. And for those of you into aerospace, this is something that you dare not miss. So check it out. Now you are only going to be seeing a small segment of the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. I tried to cover as much of it as possible, but it certainly can't fit into one video. I may release another, but none of this would have been possible without the support of my viewers. And as a result, any of you who decide to join my Discord server or follow me on Patreon, I'm going to have a B-roll of this particular tour available for you to check out some of the stuff that may not be associated with spaceflight, but as you can see, still amazing stuff. So let's get going. It's difficult to believe that a reconnaissance aircraft could possibly be this huge, but we're going to do a walk around tour of this thing, and it is utterly amazing. It's also difficult to believe that this thing was retired over three decades ago. An aircraft that's capable of speed of Mach 3.3, not too far off of what's considered hypersonic. Really astonishing if you look at the length of this thing. Utterly magnificent. Wow, what a plane. It's enough to blow your mind. And look at the size of these engines. Of course, no longer having the engines in their mounts any longer. But wow. What an aircraft. Enough to make your head spin. used for reconnaissance, presumably retired because satellites can do the job now. Because I don't know if we have anything that comes close to matching this thing's capabilities. But SR-71 in all its glory. And here we go, guys. The moment of absolute magnificence as we make our way towards the Space Shuttle Discovery. These three ports on the front are maneuvering thrusters, RCS thrusters, and the closer you get, the more impressive it is. I've seen this thing's sister ships, but I've never seen this one discovery in person, which is simply mind-blowing. All right, so once again, we got our RCS thrusters here, the nose, crew cabin, of course, and this hatch not used for spacewalks. It's not a airlock. It would actually be very dangerous to try to exit the ship using this thing. It's more of an emergency exit once it's on the ground. Still pretty cool. And then the heat tiles. It is amazing to think how many re-entries these things survived. 
and also to consider just how fast this thing was going at the moment of when it was hitting the upper level of the atmosphere at over 28,000 kilometers per hour and then dropping down to a mere 350 at the moment of touchdown. The landing gear dropping just a few seconds before the moment of touchdown. And to think once again that none of this landing was powered. All glider action, which means you never got a second chance at this. And it never failed. It obviously failed with Columbia as a result of damage from a debris strike, but that had nothing to do with this vehicle's gliding capabilities. Pilots brought it in safely again and again. Now, another question that might come to mind is why do we have different looking heat protection on the wings versus the underside? This is reinforced carbon carbon. You actually have the same thing at the nose of the craft and that's because the leading edges of these wings and also the nose experience the most intense fury of the uh, inferno of re-entry and so you had to have superior protection for the wings and for the nose and begs the question how is Starship gonna do it? Well given the fact that they're able to make this heat protection bend around just about any surface you can think of. I would say that at least for the joints and such and in Starship's fins and that sort of thing, you might, and flaps, you may want to consider something like this, something that's malleable. And this is the manipulator foot restraint. You may recall seeing this on the end of the Canadarm during EVAs. This is where the astronauts would stand when they were performing especially difficult tasks like on the Hubble, for example. And they would stand on that in order to carry out their task once again. For those of you who don't know, the Canadarm is incapable of supporting its own weight in Earth's gravity, in spite of its ability to perform very fine tasks and very, very, very uh, precision-related tasks, rather. Um, it's amazing that this thing is designed for space, and that's it. Used to provide communications relays out to space. Absolutely vital to the proper functioning and efficiency of vehicles in orbit, space shuttle, of course. And so this is one of the satellites, or an example rather, a mock-up of a satellite that would be used for those purposes. Less than a metric ton, and yet incredibly important. Those of you who remember the days of SDI, we have the HOE, which is an experimental model of an anti-ballistic missile system. Um, at the beginning when we were still thinking about the possibility of stopping a full-blown nuclear strike with something like this, it proved to be effective and we actually have smaller versions of them today. But of course, we certainly don't have comprehensive coverage and never will against a full-fledged nuclear strike. Still, on a small-scale nuclear strike, something like this could be very important. Once again, H-O-E. And for those of us who are inclined to blame the Russians for all the anti-SAT problems that we have in this day and age, this is an anti-SAT weapon, or an example of one, that a similar version of it knocked down a satellite in the 1980s and created an enormous amount of space debris. The United States actually started this interesting trend, but the program was discontinued in the 1980s. We learned early on that this wasn't a very good idea. But nevertheless, if you're interested in what an anti-SAT missile looks like, there you go. And for those of you who are under the impression that uh, Virgin Orbit is the first to do horizontal launch, that is not true. This is the Pegasus which is a horizontal launch platform used successfully on a number of occasions not nearly as cost effective as what Virgin Orbit does but still NASA is very good at setting an example of what to do at first and then private companies do it cheaper 
And of course, if you're going to talk about space flight, you have to talk about Apollo. This is a training vessel that was used for the Apollo 11 for astronauts to get used to the idea of water landings, flotation landings. You see these flotation bags here that were utilized. This is called a boilerplate command module. Obviously never went into space, um, but nevertheless served a very useful purpose for training. They trained and overtrained and planned and overplanned for that mission, which is of course one of the reasons why it succeeded. Um, and hopefully we can have that same degree of exhaustive, uh, comprehensive planning and testing for Artemis. Once again, Discovery, and you can see here on the nose that reinforced carbon carbon. Such a magnificent ship. And if you consider once again what we just looked at, the size of the Apollo module compared to this beast. And regardless of what you think about the shuttle, it definitely was a step up in terms of size and in terms of payload, in terms of innovation. There was a lot behind the shuttle that made it a huge leap forward. But unfortunately, in terms of cost, in terms of logistics, it was not. But sometimes you have to make mistakes like this in order to learn and to come up with better solutions. And if there's one thing that was definitely proven is that reusability is where it's at. And we can talk a lot about the drawbacks of the shuttle program, but really you also have to consider all the amazing things that this vehicle did. And if you consider this thing went to space 39 times without incident, it docked with the Mir. It serviced the Hubble Space Telescope. I mean, we don't have any Falcon 9 boosters, to my knowledge anyway, or I could be wrong, but I don't think so, that have been to space 39 times. So yeah, maybe it was expensive to do it, but still, in terms of reusability, Discovery still holds the crown for a ship that went to space again and again and again and probably could have kept going for a long time if you're willing to spend the money. And also you gotta talk about just how appropriate it was, the name Discovery, because this thing really did carry out a lot of firsts. John Glenn went up on this, the oldest man at least at the time, to go to space. First Hispanic woman, um, flew on Discovery, first Hispanic woman to space. First female pilot uh, went up on Discovery. The Kibo and uh, Harmony nodes both went up on Discovery. I mean, think about it. So many firsts, so many accomplishments, highlights, milestones of the uh, American space program and, and just space exploration in general accomplished by this one ship on its 39 flights 39 flights once again that's that's like preeminent reusability it's really hard to compete with that maybe one day starship will get there but it's it's hard to match 39 flights and boy it's only when you're underneath this thing you really start to appreciate just how big it is. I'm all I'm not even close to the tail end of this thing yet. Look at the, the sheer size, all of these heat tiles. A huge colossal heat shield that had to stay intact for the safety of the astronauts. all the way back to those RS-25 engines. And those are not real, by the way. All of our remaining RS-25s are being used on the SLS. Still astonishing.
Back before the time of the ISS, you had a uh, space lab in the payload bay of the shuttle. And this is a transfer tube. This is not a mock-up. This is the real thing. Transfer tube for the astronauts to safely pass between the shuttle and the space lab in its cargo bay. Quite amazing. Once again, something that's been to space many times. Sometimes the most interesting things come in the smallest packages. You have this from courtesy of the Soviet space program, an artificial gravity experiment. It actually rotated the um, outer ring of the satellite with lab rats on board, poor little guys, and then uh, also had lab rats who were in microgravity as opposed to this, which rotated rapidly enough to produce 1G worth of artificial gravity, and compared the bone mass and muscle mass loss from the rats in the 1G and discovered that there was a considerable difference between the two, indicating that artificial gravity may be a possibility. Once again, courtesy of the Soviet space program. And once again, hearkening back to the time when the Soviets were on the leading edge of space exploration, this is the Vega solar system probe that went to Venus, deploying instruments there, and then all the way to Halley's Comet. And for those of you who were alive back in the 80s, you may have recalled Carl Sagan's agitation and anger in general that everybody was sending a probe to Halley's Comet, except us, even though the cost of a probe would have been the same as a B-1 bomber, and we had a hundred of those that we had paid for at the same time. For some reason, we couldn't make do with 99, and so we had a small instrument package on this, but for the most part, this was the Soviets and the Europeans. And, of course, you can't forget the Pathfinder and Sojourner rover back in the days when we were doing everything small and it still worked. The Pathfinder was one of the most successful missions ever sent to Mars and really spearheaded the beginning of our return to the solar system after a long absence with Viking. We were finally back to the red planet in the 1990s and since then we have sent probe after probe and have learned so much. Pathfinder and Sojourner. The Apollo service module engine once again good things come in small packages. This was used to steer the Apollo module towards the moon. This tiny little engine with just over 21,000 pounds worth of thrust and this was enough to get Apollo to the moon once all those massive engines on the Saturn V got it just a few hundred miles above the Earth's surface. This little thing was capable of doing all the rest. Quite amazing. And another view of the MQF. Apollo astronauts were required to stay in this for over 60 hours after returning because of the fear of moon germs. Something we're probably going to have to reconsider when any astronauts come back from Mars. But fortunately, no moon germs. This thing was completely sealed and isolated, although I have to admit, I wouldn't regard this to be a completely safe and secure and sufficient <laughs> system to protect Earth from the possibility of some sort of extraterrestrial plague. I prefer to have that on the Lunar Gateway. And Friendship 7. I feel privileged at this moment getting to see the actual ship that John Glenn flew in. Crushed into this tiny little space to orbit the Earth three times for about five hours for the total length of the mission. Mind-blowing. And there you can see the ablative heat shield burned off. Legendary John Glenn. This is the equivalent 
of a 1960s computer. All of the operational and instrumentation systems that were used on the Saturn V, actually it's a Saturn I ring, but <laughs> serves the same purpose. <laughs> this is their equivalent, or what was the past for a computer back in those days, to handle the operations of the Saturn. <laughs> Pretty cool. And the legendary spider web enclosure that was used also uh, on the space shuttle. Actually, it was a Skylab experiment. Sorry about that. And uh, discovered that initially spiders had a tough time with uh, microgravity, but they adapted like so many things um, in our universe. This adapted, the spider adapted to the microgravity situation, started building regular webs. Again, indicating that many types of creatures might be able to survive a microgravity transit from Earth to Mars, for example. We can take more than just ourselves to the red planet. So obviously I barely scratched the surface here. Obviously you need to go and check this place out for yourself. World War II aircraft, aircraft from the Vietnam era, aircraft all the way back to World War I. Amazing things here, plus a lot of other spaceflight items that I didn't get the chance to cover in this video. None of this would have been possible without your support. Once again, thank you so much, and until next time when I find some topics to get pissed about and they're definitely out there. I urge all of you to stay angry about space.